very much for sitting. Um, Honorable Dr. Govinda Raj Pokhara, Vice Chairman of the National Planning Commission. Mr. Dr. Tapa, Parliamentarian and Chair of the Parliamentary Committee on Agriculture, Natural Resources and Energy. Mr. Jamie McGolder, United Nations Resident Coordinator and UNDP Resident Representative. Participants, friends, ladies and gentlemen, good morning and namaste. Thank you for joining us this morning. It's a pleasure to be here today and to welcome you to this Resilient Summit, in which we want to highlight and promote dialogue on resilience in Nepal to start connecting people and organizations working on resilience and encourage new models and approaches to solve complex and interrelated challenges such as extreme poverty, food security, and climatic shocks. First, I wanted to talk about the term resilience and how it came to be so central on our agenda. As you've seen in this uh, in the video, globally we had a collective wake-up call in 2011 when the worst drought in 50 years in the Horn of Africa resulted in 13.3 million people pushed to the limit and requiring emergency assistance. We saw human suffering on a massive scale. Um, again, we mobilized for an immense humanitarian response. But the reality of climate change, we're already seeing these kinds of shocks coming more and more intensely and more frequently. And we know that when shocks hit, drought, cyclones, floods, locust conflict, it is inevitably the most vulnerable populations that are the hardest hit, often without the chance to recover before new shocks strike. In November, another example, in November of last year, the largest recorded cyclone to make landfall hit the Philippines. Typhoon Haiyan resulted in over 6,000 deaths, displaced 4.1 million people, destroyed 1.1 million homes, and affected a total of, million, of 16 million people in the Philippines. Not only that, it was the sixth major storm to hit land in 2013. So right here in Nepal, we have seen some of the most serious flooding in recent history. Incidents across the country have led to more than 250 deaths, 155 injuries, nearly 255 missing persons, and about 51,000 affected people, which includes over 15,000 displaced families. Those who just survived the flooding are fortunate. However, the unfortunate reality is that the survivors will in all likelihood be driven deeper into poverty with loss of key assets and livelihoods, loss of family members, and the potential for increased incidence of disease and undernutrition. The outcome of repeated natural disasters is a cycle of crisis that millions cannot escape, resulting in great hardship, high costs, and the loss of hard-won development gains. These recurrent shocks are driving the same vulnerable communities in a crisis again and again. In the last 30 years, the World Bank estimates that one of every three dollars spent in development is lost as a result of disasters and crisis. These losses are, none, are losses that none of us can afford to sustain. And in Nepal, and globally as well, they're setting us back. So USA to pledge to get ahead of these shocks, to work with partner governor, governments across the world, across our relief and development programming, to build the kind of resilience that helps people escape from poverty and be able to adapt, mitigate, and manage the risk that it will inevitably come. So what does that mean for Nepal? Those affected by floods, both in Sindhupolchuk or the mid and far western regions, were already living on a razor, razor thin edge. They were among the country's most vulnerable. With the recent tragedy, they are in danger of falling deeper into poverty. And how can we help ensure that all populations continue on the road to inclusive growth, even in the face of current shocks? First, we need to better prepare for the flooding that we all know will come every year. What preparations would have helped this year? Flood early warning systems. We've seen that it can save thousands of lives by alerting people before the flood waters rise, as happened in the Karnali River Basin this year. Much of the losses due to, uh, to stored grain could have been prevented if we had just raised uh, grain towards up, even just a few feet in some cases. Mud houses could have been saved by elevating the foundations, uh, brick houses by using cement mortar on the first several feet of the houses. These are small changes that it could really have made a difference. Addition, additionally, introducing and making available new um, drought and flood-tolerant, climate-resilient smart cereals 
can often help save a crop that would have often been lost. And finally, innovations such as crop insurance can help farmers recover against losses. Although not the disaster that's everyone, on everyone's mind right now, we all know that earthquake is the biggest risk or disaster in Nepal. Weak construction and regulatory mechanisms have resulted in infrastructure that is extremely vulnerable to a seismic event. An estimated 60% of Kathmandu's buildings would collapse following a large earthquake, and over 2 million people would live on potentially hazardous fault lines. So what are we doing to help mitigate earthquakes and build preparedness? Focusing mainly in the Kathmandu Valley and other areas of USAID, USAID supports the government of Nepal to increase earthquake awareness and preparedness and coordinate risk reduction planning. We also help local organizations and national disaster management organizations to conduct standardized training and first medical response, collapse structure search and rescue, hospital preparedness for emergencies. And then through um, our partners like the National Society for Earthquake Technologies, USAID supports training on seismically safer construction for technical personnel, including building contractors and masons. But these efforts are clearly not enough, and we need to integrate disaster risk reduction planning into everything that we do. Second, we need resilient families and communities that are better able to prepare for and also recover from recurrent shocks. Um, one, one, our, some of our efforts in agriculture and food security help boost the farm productivity of women and other vulnerable groups by introducing high-value crops, yield-boosting technologies, building the capacity of agriculture extension agents, and local service providers, connecting farmers to inputs and to markets, and expanding small-scale irrigation. And some of the success we've had over the last five years include increasing maize productivity in Nepal by 37%, contributing to this effort. And in the dry and hill communities, high-value agriculture and marketing interventions have resulted in a nearly 300% increase in income among some of the most marginalized populations. So these are extraordinary results. But we need to do more and we need to do better. Despite major progress, almost 8 million Nepalis get by on less than $1.25 a day. For them, every decision is a trade-off with potentially catastrophic consequences. Do you buy medicines for a sick parent, provide an evening meal, meal for your children, or put a few pennies away towards next year's school fees? These questions are an everyday reality and do not allow for investments that enable people to build more resilient livelihoods. Nutrition is also a critical, is also critically important to resilience, especially in Nepal, when four in ten children under the age of five do not reach their full potential due to stunting. The government of Nepal is committed to address undernutrition, and since 2011, USAID has been supporting this effort through the Suahara Project in 25 districts to encourage simple, vital behaviors in terms of health, hygiene, and nutrition to promote a lifetime of good health for communities, families, mothers, and their children. So we're lucky to have um, a representative from um, this project to be able to talk more about that in greater detail. Thank you, Pooja, for that. Um, third, we need to support the government of Nepal at the national and local level to better prepare for and respond to emergencies. As we saw in the most recent floods, the local level line ministry coordination, planning, and capacity to respond determine the effectiveness of the response. So we're happy to have two GON leaders, with Governor Nepal leaders with us here today to discuss this issue in greater depth. Fourth, it's important to recognize that climate change is another risk multiplier, that unpredictable variability in the timing and pattern of rainfall not only affects when and how farmers are able to plant, but also increases our risk of flood. Um, through our Hario Bond, through USA's Hario Bond project program, USA and its partners are working to help the most, the poorest and most vulnerable build resilience they need to thrive in the face of a climate, a changing climate. Since 2011, our efforts have enabled 400,000 people to better manage their environment by conserving biodiversity, mitigating greenhouse emissions, and adapting to a changing environment. We know that climatic and seismic shocks will continue, and that's why we're here today at this Resilience Summit to think about and encourage smarter decisions and approaches to doing development and find ways to work together to better manage risk. 
Resilience is essential for our to win the fight against poverty, but it will take creative creativity, innovation, and more importantly, cross-sectoral partnerships. Ultimately, this new focus of resilience, we seek to save and improve more lives while reducing the need for repeated infusions of humanitarian assistance. I look forward to the discussion today. Thank you very much.